Greetings and welcome to the Cancer Interviews podcast. I'm your host, Bruce Morton. Because one's thyroid affects so many aspects of their being, a diagnosis of thyroid cancer can have so many implications. Our guest on this episode is Annie Parrish of Brighton, Colorado, and she survived everything that thyroid cancer threw her way. Now we're going to hear her story. So here she is. And Annie, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Hi. The first thing we want to do is the first thing we do with all of our interviews, and that's to learn a little bit more about you, your life exclusive of cancer. So if you would tell us a bit about where you're from, what you do for work, and when time allows for fun, what you do for fun. Sure. So I grew up in Arvada, Colorado. Um, I am a registered nurse. I now live in Brighton, and I have three wonderful kids and am divorced. And when time allows for fun. Oh, yeah. So I like to go running, hiking, swimming, very active. Now we're talking about thyroid cancer and you're a nurse. So you're in a position that most of our guests are not in that you can tell us a little bit about the thyroid and where it is and and what it does. So if you would, for those of us who who don't know, and I think that's a lot of people, um, tell us about where the thyroid sits in one's body and what it controls. Sure. So it's in the middle of your neck and um, it controls metabolism, uh, muscle and digestive function, um, bone maintenance, and then brain uh, function and, you know, development. So that's not insignificant. No. So as for you and your cancer journey, when did you notice that something was abnormal and uh, needed attention? Yeah, so 2006, I uh, had tons of energy. I was a nurse at St. Anthony Central, and um, I noticed that I had a big lump in my throat, and I was, you know, 24 years old and um, totally like golf ball size, probably. And, you know, I, it didn't cause a problem really in, in that year, but I went to my family physician at Kaiser, and they did a palpation where they just you know, stand behind you and kind of feel the, the gland. And it was in, enlarged, obviously. Um, and they did blood uh, work. They did my thyroid panel. So whenever you have thyroid issues, it's important to get a panel. So not just the TSH, because that's only one test. So you want, you know, a free T4, T3, and the TSH. And then, um, yeah, so th- those were all abnormal, um, but barely. But they said that my gland was um, hypothyroid. So when the number's up, you're hypo. And if it's low, you're hyper because it's an inverse relationship with the pituitary in your brain. Um, But they did those tests and then they wanted me to start on Synthroid. So I started on Synthroid in 2006 when I was like 24, 25. And, you know, just being on Synthroid is a bad thing because once you get put on it, your gland... Um, does not make thyroid like it did before it was on it. <laughs> so you become dependent on it generally. And they'll do that. Like they, they thought I had thyroiditis, which is just inflammation of the thyroid. And they did that because textbook, you know, physician um, in their training, they're taught that to, to first do um, a trial of Synthroid to see if you respond. And I did not. Um, It made me very hyper, of course, because, you know, Synthroid is essentially like, I I equate it to being on speed. I mean, it's very powerful medication. Um, So I had lots of energy and I lost weight, (laughs) but it slowed down my gland. And I think ultimately it didn't really prove that I had cancer. It wasn't definitive. So from there, what was the chain of events that led to your diagnosis? Well, so then I had gotten married and I met my, my husband and when I was 28, 2007, 2008, and I had three kids. And so with each subsequent pregnancy, my goiter got bigger and bigger, which, you know, as a nurse, I am aware that cancer grows really well in, a in pregnancy. We've seen, you know, lots of that, um, in, in my job and, so this lump in 28, what was it? 20, 2008, I had a choking episode at um, Steak and Ale. So I went there for my honey. It was like my, um, what do you call it? You know, like the party before you get married um, with my mom. <laughs> and I, I like 
legitimately could have died. It was so traumatic because I could not move air at all. <laughs> and I remember I took a drink of my tea and it just came out all over because I was completely obstructed with a piece of steak, um, which, you know, your esophagus is really a small tube. I think it's only a couple inches, you know, in diameter, um, like four or five, I don't know, but it was completely plugged. <laughs> and I made the universal sign for choking, which is like, I can't breathe, you know, your, your hands around your neck. And uh, my mom completely went into shock. She did not understand that I was choking. And the waiter uh, did the Heimlich on me and dislodged it. But that was kind of like a pivotal moment. Cause I think that had been my fourth or fifth episode of choking, but it, none had been that severe. And this, this lump was now, you know, gosh, bigger than a, like not quite a softball size, but big and noticeable. You know, when I'd swallow, you could see it. And I called, um, <laughs> I called the surgeon's office um, with my job and I asked for, you know, just an evaluation and they were like, well, you have to start with your physician, which I had talked to my physician. Anyway, um, I went to my family physician and they diagnosed it. Um, so we did two or three fine needle biopsies um, that were all inconclusive. They, they all came back indeterminate. And I've been told by like doctors <laughs> and other people that it's like finding, um, you know, a needle on a haystack that you have to get the right aspiration of cells in that test to find it, um, which they did not. But it, you know, it wasn't normal because there were abnormal cells because it was indeterminate. Um, so they did that and, you know, those aren't pleasant <laughs> and then they did ultrasounds and you could see it on ultrasound. And a lot of times with thyroid, um, anything that's abnormal with the ultrasound, you know, obviously gets noticed and recognized and lots of attention from the doctors, but they tend to over treat like certain things. So there's been a lot of, um, consensus in the thyroid community, you know, in endocrinology, with not treating certain things. So they have certain standards of care so that they're not just extracting all these, you know, benign cysts that don't cause any problem. But they didn't actually know I had cancer until I went for surgery in December of 2011 and had, I wanted to keep part of my gland. So I had a partial thyroidectomy. They just took half of it and that came back um, definitively. Uh, cancer. So it was a uh, follicular with a papillary variant. And then they did, you know, the, the biopsy. And then they said, you got to come back. So I had to have two surgeries. <laughs> and Annie, it's, it sounds, it sounds though, as though with everything going on, you had a level of awareness of what was going on that a lay person might not have. So given that, were you were you kind of mentally prepared for hearing that you'd been diagnosed with thyroid cancer? No, I mean, I don't think you can ever mentally prepare for that. I knew it was cancer because what else grows like that in pregnancy? You know, I mean, that I knew definitively by myself that it was, but I didn't know if I wanted to get it out. And I had multiple discussions with people, you know, educated people um, and a lot of not naturopaths that did not want me to get it out. <laughs> And like my aunt does didn't still to this day did, does not believe I should have gotten it out because she feels like I could have, you know, cured it um, using holistic medicine. But I didn't want to be one of those people either that, um, you know, goes without having surgery and having it just keep growing. Because I mean, it was wrapping around, it put pressure on my carotid artery. Um, so to me, that's impairing blood flow to my brain. You know, you have your carotids, you have your vertebrals. That's one of four branches of blood flow that I need. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I was not prepared for it being cancer, though. I don't think anybody is because when you hear the word cancer, you think I'm going to die. <laughs> so that, that kind of, you know, it was a, it was a huge deal. Um, my, my aunt came and helped me with the kids because, you know, I had at that point, two kids and taking care of two kids full-time and having a full-time job as a nurse. Like, I don't know what I would have done if she hadn't come out from Albuquerque to help me because <laughs> it was all I could do to just like go through it and um, not freak out. You know what I mean? Not like 
go into catastrophe mode where you think you're dying and so nothing matters and <laughs> you know what what people do when they have cancer it's very very frightening by the way if you like what you hear in this segment we invite you to subscribe to our podcast by click by checking the links below once you're there you'll see a bell icon and if you click on that we will notify you when we post a new interview Annie, it sounds like you had a number of paths you could have gone by way of treatment. When you think of the direction that you ultimately went in, was that a tough decision? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, as a nurse, um, like I think long term, and I think you know, thirty, forty years down the road, what what will happen? You know, from my actions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was really tough to to have surgery because there's no going back, you know, like, you, it, like with the partial thyroidectomy, I thought I could just leave half and have half a gland and not have so much Synthroid, but that, you know, with cancer, I don't want to leave any cancer there to grow. So, you know, it's like dandelions when they spread. Um, that's how it was explained to me that the metastasis rate, you know, if they don't get it all, it just, um, it can come back. So, there was surveillance um, every like, I don't know, six months I got ultrasounds afterward and they took all of my uh, lymph nodes. So 12, I think 12 lymph nodes. And then they had a tumor board that met because of the size of my um, cancer uh, because it was so big that, you know, there's standard protocols. And they said, I did not need chemo, which I was very thankful about because that would have been so hard to go through and so hard for my family. Um, you know, it's an ordeal <laughs> to go through chemo. So I was really thankful for that. Um, you sound like you were at peace with your care plan, but as we've learned from talking to so many guests, it's so important that you have a good feeling that you have a high level of trust for your care team. How did yeah. you feel about your care team? I love them. I had a great um, surgeon that had an ENT in on the surgery so that they didn't damage my vocal cords because that happens a lot where they inadvertently um, nick the nerve, you know, to your, your larynx, your voice box. So yeah, I was, I was very impressed with the, the level of expertise in my team and the fact that they consulted me for little things, you know, um, all throughout. And I, I felt like I knew the game plan from the get-go and yeah, it's very important to trust your team. Otherwise, you know, you, you second guess and I, I, it would be hard to fight with the care team while you're fighting cancer. <laughs> so while you were going through the process of treatment, looking back, what would you say was the toughest part of the treatment process? Uh, the recovery, like, I mean, definitely. Um, I had a tonsillectomy um, when I had my thyroidectomy because my tonsils were huge. And so they just did that all together. But um, the recovery in terms of the metabolism part, so not like the surgical site, you know, that had stitches that got better right away. I had a great scar that nobody can even see, you know, it's like concealed. So I was really happy with the scar because, you know, being young, um, that's an, an issue. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to look like I've seen some people with thyroid scars that are horrible. Um, anyway, the scar is not the big deal, but the metabolism was really, really hard because I felt like a train hit me, like not the day after and not the week after, but the next week, um, my TSH level was up to a hundred. So normal TSH is like, you know, zero to like 10, I guess. And they keep lowering that. So some say, you know, it depends on the scale, but the hypothyroid rate that I had post-op and I, and I had meds, it, it just takes a long time to get a good blood level to where you actually feel normal. And then the treatment with the Synthroid, I think is the hardest part because the regulation of that is so crucial for just your mental well being and your mood and functioning, you know, like having any energy. <laughs> like I can tell immediately when I take my thyroid med, my Synthroid, because I get a headache <laughs> and I know, oh, that's my, that's my thyroid. That's, you know, th that's the pig um, thyroid that I'm taking. But I, I was on T3 and T4 for a while, and that helped a lot because there's a lot of debate in the medical community whether T3 is really important because your body converts T4 into T3. And so, you know, I'm, I'm into all that because as a nurse, I like to know 
why, <laughs> you know, and the rationale behind why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so the T3 really helped. Like I felt almost normal, but not quite. And I've come to the, you know, realization, sadly, that I may never look like I did or feel like I did, which is okay. I mean, I'm here. I don't know that that would have metastasized and actually like killed me, but it's good to be cancer free. It's good to not choke on things. <laughs> but I think that the, the regulation of the thyroid hormone and then just the post-op recovery with the metabolism and getting that blood level was the worst part. And then people not understanding because I had like several of your other guests, oh, thyroid cancer is the best kind to have, you know? No, it, it's still cancer and it's dismissed as like, oh, it's this little gland, but it controls. I mean, I've heard people say every single function in your body is determined um, by your thyroid gland, which I don't know if every single function, but it is a very important gland. And I feel like it's dismissed as just the thyroid, you know. Annie, you mentioned... You, you gave me an answer when I asked about the toughest part of the treatment, but here's another part of the treatment that I'm sure would be unique, not necessarily to you, but unique to people who do what you do. How difficult, how challenging was it to be living and breathing each day, this role reversal of uh, here you are, nurse, you're, it, it is, uh, it's normal for you to be providing care now you're on the other end of that. How difficult was that? Very, very. To, to feel vulnerable and to feel like you're not in control of what happens or how things go. And I had my uncle tell me it'll make you a better nurse. And it, it did. I'm definitely more compassionate and more understanding and more communicative because I think a lot of times we assume people know things or, you know, we don't explain things like we should um, in lay terms. So it's made me much more sensitive and empathic to that. But it was extremely difficult because, you know, as a nurse, you're, you're leading so many, um, you know, different things, like you're doing things and communicating and you're in charge, essentially. And I was not in charge of this. <laughs> You had mentioned your aunt as a source of support. Was there anybody else who, uh, who was there for you in a big way and, and made this difficult time for you a bit less difficult? No, um, not really. I didn't have a lot of support and uh, it was really difficult because I felt very angry. <laughs> um, my dad came to see me in the hospital, but um, that was it. So I, I did not, I was like, wow, I'm one of those people. Because <laughs> I've taken care of many people that were really sad that their family didn't come and see them and didn't help out. So no, it was just me. And, you know, my aunt helped immensely. And without her, I, I would have been so depressed. <laughs> because, you know, I, I still had to look forward to going back to work, um, which was wonderful. But, you know, um, that didn't, that was really a hard transition too, because, you know, um, I had stitches and so people would ask like, you know, when I, I worked, um, the stitches came out, I think right before I went back to work. So it was like a fresh scar and, you know, people notice, and I'm sure it, you know, it, it, I wasn't real like closed off with it, but I had people say like what happened. And then I had other nurses that were completely not very nice, you know? So that was hard because I expected, you know, them to be there for me and to be happy that I'm back to work and that I want to be at work. And that didn't, that, that wasn't the reality. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Did the process evolve to a point in which that was less of a problem? Oh yeah. I mean, it wasn't a problem. Like I'm not at work to be, um, you know, applauded or any of that. So I didn't care really, but it hurt. Um, and it, it I, I don't think that I, I, I think a lot of problems came for me professionally after my thyroid diagnosis that are completely unrelated to thyroid issues. Um, but I think it was kind of like a red herring that people could pick on me with. And yeah, I, I, it's really unfortunate because, you know, if I had 
maybe got in a different job, <laughs> you know, at a different place where people didn't know me, I think it would have been a lot better and it would have went a lot better for me, you know, in terms of my profession and my career and just being accepted because I think, um, I'm so much of an open book, you know, I talk about things and I'm open with everything, you know, like, like life, um, that that's a problem, <laughs> especially, you know, having cancer and being vulnerable and being open. Well, let's talk about a more pleasant aspect of all this. And, and that is uh, the trajectory you were on, because at some point you started to show signs of improvement, physically speaking. And what was that like? And, and what were the signs? What were the things that tipped you off that that you were on a good path? Uh, well, so in 2014, I did the MS-150, which is like 150 miles on a bike from, you know, Westminster, Fort Collins, and then back. And so that kind of made me feel like, wow, I'm making some kind of big progress that I'm able to do that because I never did anything like that pre-cancer. Um, so that made me feel really hopeful that I can live a normal life and not be, you know, held back. <laughs> And eventually that positive trajectory had to lead to a point in which you felt that you had attained survivorship. When that happened, uh, just how exciting was that? Great. Yeah, that was great because I worried for a long time with the, so the thyroid bed, you know, with the ultrasounds they monitor. And um, I worried that it would come back because the whole suppression of your, your thyroid is a big thing like post-op. So, you know, those first, I think, couple months and then probably a year or something, I don't know exactly. And I don't know that we actually even know how long um, that that is supposed to be suppressed. But, you know, the higher the level of your thyroid, the more um, likelihood that the tumor could proliferate and spread. Um, so yeah, being, I think when I hit a year out, I was pretty hopeful that it wasn't going to come back because, you know, it, it generally, you would know before that, that's why they do the surveillance with the ultrasounds. And then they, they check a thyroglobin level as well. And thyroglobin is one of the like key markers that the, the cancer has come back, you know, if that's high, cause it's interacting with the cells there. Um, so that, that was really, I felt really, really good and really blessed that I had went through this. Now, if you think about what you were able to do physically pre-diagnosis and what you can do now, you've already told us about that um, challenging bike ride you were able to go on. But if you were, if you were to compare yourself pre-diagnosis to what you can do now, what can you do and what you, what cannot you do? Well, everything, I mean, anything. I, I feel pretty empowered that, you know, my life isn't over because of this cancer diagnosis. So, I mean, I'm the same person. It's just being on Synthroid. So, you know, I don't sleep as well as I would like. Um, so I make sure that I have a really good sleep routine and that I, you know, have a whole calming ritual before I go to bed, which really helps. But, but being on Synthroid, I guess that's like a common theme because I've talked to other people that are, you know, on it and they have the same issues. So, I mean, in terms of what I can and can't do, well, I, I, I don't nap. I haven't napped since 20, I don't know, 2011, 2012. So that's very unfortunate. Like, even if I tried to nap, there's no way I can nap. Um, unless I was like physically exhausted and then maybe I haven't tried that yet, but um, yeah, I mean, I, the sky's the limit. I can do whatever I want. Annie, we're going to bring this to a close. And when we bring our interviews to a close, we always ask the same question of our guest. And that is, if you encountered somebody who had just been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and you had some things that you wanted to say to them, things plural, if you could pick one thing out of that group, one overarching thing that you would really want to drive home to that person who had just been diagnosed, what would it be? Um, to ask for help, you know, to, to, to tell your friends and your neighbors, Hey, um, I'm really going through something. And, you know, if you could bring by a meal or if you could watch my kids, uh, for a night or something like that, that would be, you know, I, that would have helped me immensely. Um, just knowing that there were other people that cared, like I, I obviously knew people cared, 
but I would tell the person that was just diagnosed to just be your own advocate and like ask for resources. Like don't assume people are going to step up, you know, be that person that asks for help. <laughs> That's what I would say. Excellent. Our guest is Annie Parrish of Brighton, Colorado, a mom, a nurse, and a survivor of thyroid cancer. Annie, thanks so much for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. I have no doubt that this is going to resonate with somebody at a very pivotal time in their life. It's information that they can use to uh, help themselves along the way with their cancer journey. So Annie, once again, thanks so much. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, please visit us online at cancerinterviews.com. We appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you back here again next time on the Cancer Interviews Podcast.